by little over the edge till at last nothing was left but some little dull globules of quicksilver in the bottom. If they were soft and yielding, the pan needed some salt or some sulfate of copper or some other chemical rubbish to assist digestion. If they were crisp to the touch and would retain a dent, they were frightened with all the silver and gold they could seize and hold, and consequently the pans needed a fresh charge of quicksilver. When there was nothing else to do, one could always screen tailings. That is to say, he could shovel up the dried sand that had washed down to the ravine through the troughs and dash it against an upright wire screen to free it from pebbles and prepare it for working over. The process of amalgamation differed in the various mills, and this included changes in style of pans and other machinery, and a great diversity of opinion existed as to the best in use. But none of the methods employed involved the principles of milling or without screening the tailings. Of all recreations in the world, screening tailings on a hot day with a long-handled shovel is the most undesirable. At the end of the week, the machinery was stopped and we cleaned up. This, that is to say, we got the pulp out of the pans and batteries and washed the mud patiently away till nothing was left but the long accumulating mass of quicksilver with its imprisoned treasures. This was made into heavy, compact snowballs and piled them up in a bright, luxurious heap for inspection. Making these snowballs cost me a fine gold ring, that and ignorance together, for the quicksilver invaded the ring with the same facility with which water saturates a sponge. Separating its particles and the ring crumbled to pieces. We put our pile of quicksilver balls into an iron retort that had a pipe leading from it to a pail of water and then applied a roasting heat. The quicksilver turned to vapor, escaping through the pipe into the pail and the water turned it into good, wholesome quicksilver again. Quicksilver is very costly, and they never waste it. On opening the retort, there was one week. Uh, there was our week's work, a lump of pure white, frosty-looking silver, twice as large as a man's head. Perhaps a fifth of the mass was gold, but the color of it did not show, would not have shown if two-thirds of it had been gold. We melted it up and made a solid brick of it by pouring it into an iron brick mold. By such a tedious and laborious process were silver bricks obtained. This mill was but one of many others in operation at the time. The first one in Nevada was built at Egan Canyon and was a small, insignificant affair and compared most unfavorably with some of the immense establishments afterwards located at Virginia City and elsewhere. From our bricks, a little corner was chipped off for the fire assay, a method used to determine the proportions of gold, silver, and base metals in the mass. This is an interesting process. The chip is hammered out as thin as paper and weighed on scales so fine and sensitive that if you weigh a two-inch scrap of paper on them and then write your name on the paper with a coarse, soft pencil and weigh it again, the scales will take marked notice of the addition. Then a little lead, also weighed, is rolled up with the flake of silver, and the two are melted at a great heat in a small vessel called a couple, made by, made by compressing bone ashes into a cup shoe, into a cup shape in a steel mold. The base metals oxidize and are absorbed with the lead into the pores of the couple, a bottom or globule of perfectly pure gold and silver is left behind, and by weighing it and, and noting the loss, the assayer knows the proportion of base metal the brick contains. He has to separate the gold from the silver now. The button is hammered out flat and thin, put in the furnace and kept some time at a red heat. After cooling it off, it is rolled up like a quill and heated in a glass vessel containing nitric acid. The acid dissolves the silver and leaves the gold pure and ready to be weighed on its own merits. Then salt water is poured into the vessel containing the dissolved silver, and the silver returns to palpable form again and sinks to the bottom. Nothing now remains but to weigh it 
Then the proportions of the several metals contained in the brick are known, and the assayer stamps the value of the brick upon its surface. The sagacious reader will know now, without being told, that the speculative miner is getting a fire assay made of a piece of rock from his mine. To help him sell the same, was not in the same was not in the habit of picking out the least valuable fragment of rock uh, on his dump pile, but quite the contrary. I have seen men hunt over a pile of nearly worthless quartz for an hour, and at last find a little piece as large as a filbert, which was rich in gold and silver, and this was reserved for a fire assay. Of course, the fire assay would demonstrate that a ton of such rock would yield hundreds of dollars, and on such assays, many an utterly worthless mine was sold. Assaying was a good business, and so some men engaged in it occasionally, who were not strictly scientific and capable. One assayer got such rich results out of all specimens brought to him that in time he acquired almost a monopoly of the business. But like all men who achieve success, he became an object of envy and suspicion. The other assayers entered into a conspiracy against him and let some prominent citizens into the secret in order to show that they meant fairly. Then they broke a little fragment off a carpenter's grindstone and got a stranger to take it to the popular scientist and got it assayed. In the course of an hour, the result came, whereby it appeared that a ton of that rock would yield $1,284.40 in silver and $366.36 in gold. Due publication of the whole matter was made in the paper and the popular assay or left town between two days. I will remark in passing that I only remained in the milling business one week. I told my employer I could not stay longer without an advance in my wages, that I liked quartz milling, indeed was infatuated with it, that I had never before grown so tenderly attached to an occupation in so short a time, that nothing, it seemed to be, gave such scope to intellectual activity as feeding a battery and screening tailings, and nothing so stimulated the moral attributes as retorting bullion and washing blankets. Still, I felt constrained to ask an increase of salary. He said he was paying me $10 a week and thought it a good round sum. How much did I want? I said about $400,000 a month and board was about all I could reasonably ask considering the hard times. I was ordered off the premises and yet when I look back to those days and call to mind the exceeding hardness of the labor I performed in that mill, I only regret that I did not ask him 700000 Shortly after this, I began to grow crazy, along with the rest of the population, about the mysterious and wonderful cement mine, and to make preparations to take advantage of any opportunity that might offer to go and help hunt for it. Chapter 37 the White Man's Cement Mine, story of its discovery, a secret expedition, a nocturnal adventure, a distressing position, a failure in a week's holiday. It was somewhere in the neighborhood of Mono Lake that the marvelous White Man Cement Mine was supposed to lie. Every now and then it would be reported that Mr. W. had passed stealthily through Esmeralda at dead of night in disguise and that we would have a wild excitement because he must be steering for his secret mine and now was the time to follow him. In less than three hours after daylight all the horses and mules and donkeys in the vicinity would be bought, hired or stolen and half the community would be off for the mountains following in the wake of white man but W would drift about through the mountain gorges for days together in a purposeless sort of way until the provisions of the miners ran out and they would have to go back home. I have known it reported at 11 at night in a large mining camp that white man had just passed through and in two hours the streets so quiet before would be swarming with men and animals. Every individual would be trying to be very secret but yet venturing to whisper to just one neighbor that W had passed through. And long before daylight, this is the dead of winter, 
The stampede would be complete, the camp deserted, and the whole population gone chasing after W. The tradition was that in the early immigration more than 20 years ago, three young Germans, brothers who had survived an Indian massacre on the plains, wandered on foot through the deserts, avoiding all trails and roads, and simply holding a westerly direction and hoping to find California before they starved or died of fatigue. And in a gorge in the mountains, they sat down to rest one day when one of them noticed a curious vein of cement running along the ground, shot full of lumps of dull yellow metal. They saw that it was gold, and that here was a fortune to be acquired in a single day. The vein was about as wide as a curbstone, and fully two-thirds of it was pure gold. Every pound of that wonderful cement was worth well nigh two hundred dollars. Each of the brothers loaded himself with about twenty-five pounds of it, and then they covered up all traces of the vein made a rude drawing of the locality and the principal landmarks in the vicinity and started westward again. But troubles thickened about them. In their wanderings, one brother fell and broke his leg, and the others were obliged to go on and leave him to die in the wilderness. Another, worn out and starving, gave up by and by and laid down to die. But after two or three weeks of incredible hardships, the third reached the settlements of California, exhausted, sick, and his mind deranged by his sufferings. He had thrown away all his cement but a few fragments, but these were sufficient to set everybody wild with excitement. However, he had enough of the cement country. However, he had had enough of the cement country, and nothing could induce him to lead a party thither. He was entirely content to work on a farm for wages, but he gave white man his map and described the cement region as well as he could and thus transferred the curse to that gentleman. For when I had my one accidental, an, accidental glimpse of Mr. W. and Esmeralda, he had been hunting for the lost mine, and hunger and thirst, poverty and sickness, for 12 and 13 years. Some people believed he had found it, but most people believed he had not. I saw a piece of cement as large as my fist, which was said to have been given to white man by the young German, and it was of a seductive nature. Lumps of virgin gold were as thick as it, in it as raisins in a slice of fruitcake. The privilege of working such a mine one week would be sufficient for a man of reasonable desires. A, a new partner of ours, a Mr. Higby, knew white man well by sight, and a friend of ours, a Mr. Van Dorn, was well acquainted with him, and not only that, but had white man's promise that he should have a private hint in time to enable him to join the next cement expedition. Van Dorn had promised to extend the, hunt, the hint to us. One evening, Higby came in greatly excited and said he had felt certain he had recognized white man uptown, disguised and in a pretended state of intoxication. In a little while, Van Dorn arrived and confirmed the news, and so we gathered in our cabin and with heads close together, arranged our plans in impressive whispers. We were to leave town quietly after midnight in two or three small parties so as not to attract attention, and meet at dawn 